elected as Louisville's 50th mayor in 2010, Greg Fisher has led the city as it has experienced an economic renaissance, adding 83,000 jobs and 3,000 new businesses. These are things that I think we tend to forget uh, during uh, times of uh, bad public health in the form of COVID and racial unrest. But, but these are significant achievements. During his tenure, the city attracted more than $20 billion in capital construction, that's billion, including two new bridges, three new regional libraries, a soccer stadium, a new West Louisville track, and more than two dozen new hotels built to support the city's thriving bourbon and local food tourism. When tragedy struck the city and nation in 2020, he recommitted his administration to tackling increased public safety challenges. Also dismantling systemic racism, including police reform, and marshaling all resources to hasten Louisville's recovery from COVID-19. So join me in welcoming our mayor in what I hope will be an interesting and entertaining conversation. All right. And the staff has told me, I think if we speak at about this level, we're fine. Is that right? Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, welcome. Thank you. And what were the deciding factors in your decision to run for mayor in the first place 12 years ago? Well, first, uh, thanks for having me here at the Filson and, and to all the supporters here. What's happened at the Filson over these last decade has just been amazing. So it's something the city is really proud to have, both from a substantive standpoint and architecturally as well. So thank you to our late friend, Owsley Brown, too, for being such a big, big part of this. Yeah. So congratulations. Thank you. Well, running for office, deciding to run for office is no small matter. As everybody knows, it's not a real low key position. And I was used to kind of having a low profile uh, in the community, but I loved uh, running and developing businesses, especially uh, high performance businesses, because I saw what happens when you build a good system and the people involved with it receive so much joy from increasing their capacity to do good or contribute to an organization. And I've always been interested in uh, kind of how can you help at scale and interested in public policy. And so a mayor's job is one where you can make a big difference. I, I call mayors the essential workers of American politics because you're not hiding out in a governor's mansion or you're not just making legislative discussions. And this uh, executive that ran organizations, I th think was a better skill set for me. So I was curious because the purpose of the business is always uh, ran was, let's say with Servin was to, we made ice and we designed and made ice and beverage dispensing equipment, but why? You know, to help people realize their full human potential. Uh, and so could you create a city government that led people to realizing more of their full human potential? Because a lot of people need a lot of help in cities, especially those in under-resourced areas. So I thought if I could make a contribution to that, it would be a uh, really worthwhile time, uh, worth, worthwhile thing to do so. And I come from a family where my mom's value was, if you can help somebody, help them. Don't ask what's in it for you, just do it. And my dad, who sadly passed away two months ago, uh, his value was always everybody's the same, whether it's Sam the Shoeshine Man or the president of IBM, where he worked for a long time. So I grew up in that kind of environment. They didn't state those values, but they modeled those values. And it was great preparation for mayor. I say a good mayor has to have the head of a chief executive officer, but the heart of a social worker. It's not like running a business. It has business-like aspects to it, but it's much broader than that. So all that came together to decide to run for mayor and uh, had a real exciting first campaign. And uh, it's, it's quite exhilarating when you win a close campaign and several of y'all helped me. Thank you for that. What you want when you win a campaign is you want the excitement that comes with a close victory, but the certainty of victory. 
and those two don't coexist. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you made the decision to run, how old were your all's children? And what has been the effect, both good and bad, on your family? Yeah, was, over the last 12 years. Right. Uh, well, I'm married to uh, Dr. Alex Gerasimides. Several of you all know her. Uh, she is a fierce citizen. Uh, her mom and dad uh, fled the civil war that was going on in Greece after the end of World War II. Uh, so she embraces democracy in all of its uh, aspects. So she's always been totally supportive of me on this journey because it is a family endeavor. Uh, being a mayor, a good mayor, I believe, you know, it's a 24-7 type of experience. So you've got to have support at home. But the decision on the family was easier because uh, three of our four children were out of uh, house already in college or graduated. Mary, our youngest, was a sophomore at Assumption High School at that time. And so if the kids were younger, I doubt if we would have made that kind of decision. But I'm sure it's it's difficult when your uh, father has a high public profile and, um, you know, you can say, well, you don't want to put pressure on your kids to achieve. Some people think this is an achievement and there's comes with a lot of criticism as well. So you don't want them to be the brunt of that. But hopefully what they've seen is, uh, you know, somebody trying to do their best for everybody, regardless of their circumstances, and that'll inspire them in some way to try to do their best and to help people. So I think net net, it's definitely been a positive thing because it, it matures them faster because they see kind of all the beauty and all the ugliness that's in the world and how to uh, hopefully humbly celebrate victories, but then gracefully work through tragedies as well. And, you know, that's part of life. And so the sooner you can learn that in life, I think the better it's going to help you and put you in a position to help more people. So I'm hopeful that's the impact it's had on our kids. Mayor, I want to focus on the word compassion. Um, it appears to me that that one word has been maybe the lodestar of your administration. Can you tell us if that's accurate and how you decided on that and what you've done over the 12 years to, to flesh it out. Yeah. Well, uh, so I'm a business guy that just happens to be mayor. And I think great businesses have guiding values. You got to make a lot of decisions. So how can you develop some consistency and some rhythm in your decisions? And if you have guiding values, it's easier to do that. So I thought, you know, what are they going to be for our city? And the first two were easy for me to articulate, you know, a city of lifelong learning, because any city you go to where it's really happening, you're seeing curious people always learning, entrepreneurship going on. Uh, the second was an even healthier city. And we're not as healthy as what we should be as a city. Our environment needed some help, too. Uh, when you think about mental health challenges, spiritual health challenges, environmental health challenges. And the third one I was looking for was people recognizing the dependence that we have on each other. And so I was kind of kicking it back and forth. And actually it was in a conversation with Christy Brown in my headquarters. And I was saying, you know, I'm thinking about all this, but I can't come up with the right word. And she and she blurted out compassion. And so uh, that's how that came into being. And as I mentioned values in my business lives, you know, compassion to me is an action word. That means we respect everybody. So we're helping their full human potential flourish. That's a lot in that definition. Yeah. And when you approach the citizens uh, of Louisville, about 800,000 of us that way, that's a lot to unpack. And there's a lot of people that need a lot of assistance in a lot of different ways. But it's like a huge honor to be in a position to impact that. So like one of the most dramatic ways, and the reason why I ran for a third term was so that we could get our Evolve 502 Promise Scholarships funded. This was the result of 10 years worth of work, uh, starting with the 55,000 degree initiative, which morphed into Cradle to Career, which then morphed into Evolve 502. So now every public school graduate in Louisville has a 
pre-pathway to a college degree or a credential. Why is that important? The number one cause of challenges that comes through any mayor's office of any decent sized city are all related to poverty. And then how do you disrupt poverty? A post-secondary degree or a credential. And so that's why that's so critical and it's gonna impact tens of thousands of families and help them realize their full human potential. How is Evolve 502 funded? It's, uh, it's a combination of private and public funds, so primarily uh, private. Uh, Mary Gwen Wheeler you know, was the president or director of 55,000K initiative. The mayor, whomever that might be, is the chair of that initiative, and it's evolved a little bit over the years, but uh, education has been super critical to Mary Gwen and her pri priorities in the CNS Foundation. Uh, so once we established this rubric, which took a little while, and we had some great partners with Harvard through a program called By All Means, uh, that's when we said, okay, we just got to get started raising the money. And then I was able to use the mayor's office to work with the council for us to put in about $6 million of what will be raised in around $30 million so far. Uh, so a lot of foundation money, a lot of private money, some of you all in this room. But it, it is it was really great. Uh, we had a cel Sunday uh, celebration of our end of term on Sunday, and a young man showed up who was uh, 20 years old, a uh, refugee from uh, Kenya, grew up in a refugee camp, so excited and so full of life. And I said, so what's going on? Well, he tells me the story, and, uh, and he goes, I'm at Jefferson Community and Technical College now. He said, I'm an Evolve 502 scholar. And so, you know, the way all this stuff comes together, because we really emphasize the growth of our foreign born community here, because as a percentage of our population, it was much lower than what it should be for a city our size. So we really emphasize that because I think our kids should grow up in a city that looks like the world, because there's just going to be interacting with the world. So it was really fun to me when you talk about compassion coming to life to see that emphasis on our foreign born population, a young refugee comes here. He gets an Evolve 502 scholarship. It's going to transform his life. So, you know, that's just a little snapshot yeah. of how it comes together. Racial equity is another big part of that. Let's talk about achievements and disappointments. Um, <clears throat> there are any number of areas that we could do that analysis in. Let's start with public safety. What are the achievements? What are your disappointments? over the last 12 years? Well, public safety has just been a super dynamic area for Louisville and for the country. Uh, we have a major problem in America and in Kentucky and Louisville, and it's a four letter word and it's G-U-N-S. Yeah. Uh, we are the only country in the world that suffers the level of gun violence that we have. Uh, well, the leading cause or le leading result of gun violence is suicides, okay? And that tends to be more of a rural white male problem. But the availability of guns in our society is unlike anything else in the rest of the world. And that's why you see all this gun violence taking place uh, in, in America and in our city as well. Shootings are down 33% this year. Homicides are down 15%, which is great progress. But it's horrible. One is too many. So this is a real problem for the country, and it's a real problem uh, for Louisville. It's going to be an ongoing problem. Uh, you know, the state legislature passed some super responsible legislation in my mind a couple of years ago where, you know, 18-year-old kid can go and buy an assault rifle. Uh, you see folks walking around with guns hanging off of their neck. You can walk down Main Street with an assault rifle. All this is totally legal, and I do not think that's what the founders of this country had in mind when they uh, when the Second Amendment was created. So this is a big challenge. Uh, and it's going to remain a challenge because it's the headline crime. And, and you can attack it in a whole bunch of different ways, which we've done with uh, investments in intervention and prevention. The number one driver behind it, in my view, when you take out, uh, say, poverty, or when you take out uh, suicides, is poverty. Uh, when you put together poverty and massive prolifer proliferation of guns, that is a toxic combination that, again, we're the only country in the world that has this. And so when people say, gosh, I wonder why this has happened in the United States of America, to me, it's pretty simple. So we have a better chance, I think, in America of eliminating poverty than we do of getting this gun issue under control. 
because you can eliminate poverty through policy choices that you make. And many of you all are well-traveled in this room. You know, there's, there's a dozen, 20 countries in the world where there is no poverty, where there is no homelessness, uh, where there is no violence to speak of. And that's because people's basic needs are met, housing, health care, education, and their direct policy choices that are related to taxation. So if the people that make over a quarter million dollars a year in this country were taxed, let's say, at a 5% higher rate, you could provide a family supporting wage instead of a minimum wage that doesn't provide the basics. So those answers are in front of us if we want to make those choices as a country. And I think sooner or later you have to because violence, it to me is a moral issue. It's an economic issue that impacts your ability to have good employees and people that make enough money to buy businesses stuff. And then ultimately it becomes a public safety issue for people that have lots of assets. So uh, we need to deal with that more effectively at the federal and state level, because it all trickles down uh, to the local level. You were president of the National Mayor's Association. Is this something that's, I guess, shared by every major metropolitan area in the country? And did you all come out with any recommended um, solutions for Congress to consider? Yeah. Yeah. I was the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. The first, the last six months of the Trump presidency and the uh, first six months of the Biden presidency. So talk about a difference. Uh, and that also, the, the last six months of the Biden or the Trump presidency also overlapped with the pandemic and the protest uh, in our city. So that was quite an intense time. Uh, but yeah, 80% of America's cities are, have seen a spike like we have in gun violence and, and shootings. Uh, and unfortunately, it's become a political issue. Uh, you know, it's an asset test for, you know, Republican, Democrat within the Republican Party as well, although the NRA is losing influence, uh, which is a good thing. And I'm all for the Second Amendment and all these reasonable gun uh, uh, laws that are out there, but it's just a problem right now. So what, you know, mayors can be vocal, which we are, but until the political calculus changes to where you as an elected official, if you're on the wrong side of a gun issue, you're gonna get voted out, then I'm not real optimistic about that. Uh, but what we can do in the meantime is put a lot of investment in education like we're doing, uh, in intervention, so that if you can have what we've developed in the city, groups of community violence interrupters, folks that know the streets, that might've been involved with the streets before, that are interrupting a pattern of violence because normally what happens with uh, gun violence is one act of gun violence if it's related to the street and gang activity or some other kind of beef that leads to another act of gun violence and retribution you know it's just an ongoing cycle so when you have a, a group of community violence interrupters cvi is what we call that they get in front of that so they know that you know Ann was shot by Susie, and then now Susie's going to go and shoot Nancy, and you know, and you get in the middle of all that. So that's intervention, and then the prevention work is just uh, investing in young people so that they don't choose to go down a life of violence. And if you if you come from a family that is a multi generational uh, family that's been involved with violence and gun violence, when you're born into that that's as normal to you as you and I sitting up here and having yeah. this conversation. So you've got to disrupt that. And again, usually that's related to poverty in the situation the families were born into. So these are areas that are, should be as important to the community as policing is. Because normally when people talk about violence and crime, they want to say, well, how many police officers do we have? What are the police doing about this? You know, I mean, that's, you talk about passing the buck. The police are the enforcement arm of the law. You know, we expect them to be domestic violence counselors, homeless experts, you know, youth counselors. So one of the things in the, these past couple of years as we've done is fund these different areas. And we have people now, when you call in the 911, if a more appropriate response, let's say, is from a uh, domestic violence coordinator or a mental health coordinator or someone that uh, knows homelessness, that's who's deployed, not the police officers. And you got to remember this spike really just started happening now about two and a half years ago. So before then, that all the spike took place in the summer of 2020 here and all over the country. 
what happened in the summer of 2020. You know, that's when you start, that's when the big racial justice protests started taking place around the country. So when that took place, and that was in the pandemic, so during the pandemic, that social support system that was in place, let's say a boys and girls clubs, uh, mentorship programs, where there was a lot of interface between young people that needed adult attention, that was fractured, you know, because we weren't seeing each other anymore. And then also the police started withdrawing uh, from the public, you know, for two reasons. One, like in our city where we had over 100 nights of protest, they were helping with the protest. And two, they saw what happened in Minneapolis with the George Floyd mur murder up there. And when, you know, a police officer shows up, everything's being filmed. They're like, well, you know what? I'm just not going to show up anymore. So th these are a combination of events and then more guns right on the heels of really restrictive, or relaxed gun laws passed in Frankfurt was really a difficult situation for us here and in other states as well. Go briefly, I guess, to, to policing and also police reform, um, because you've been front and center in the middle of all of it. Are, does Louisville have uh, sufficient numbers of police uh, or are there budgetary constraints that you've had to deal with there? And then talk to us, if you would, about you know, whatever reforms you think are necessary and we're able to actualize. Yeah. Well, that's a real, we can talk about that for a whole hour, yeah. but uh, you should know first, there's no correlation when you look around the country in terms of the number of police and public safety. So a lot of folks just say there just needs to be more police and we'll be safer. Uh, there's no data that supports that. So you need an adequate number of police, certainly. We're, we're at about, our authorized force is 1,200, and we're at about 975 to 1,000 right now. Fortunately, police recruiting has picked back up. It really hit a low here and everywhere in 2020 and 2021. You can understand why. We were able to significantly elevate compensation for police to where now, after two years, as a police officer, you can be making around $80,000 or so. So it's a, a decent wage, but uh, pensions were taken away from police officers uh, and all public employees about uh, by 10 years or so ago. There was, it was halfway and then five years or so, no pension. Um, pensions uh, create a financial barrier, but when you're asking somebody to put their life on the line literally every day, uh, and you get paid basically what you can paid by going, let's say, working in, you know, middle wage America, it takes a special person to do that. A pension really helps, you know, to say, if you do this work after, let's say, 25, 28 years, uh, you can be supported with health care and a wage the rest of your life. That draws a different person into that. Why were the pensions taken away? The financial burden of them, basically. Uh, as a state, uh, you know, we, they were underfunded, uh, so that's that's why. But it's a, it really impacts the kind of people that you draw into public service, which is largely unappreciated. Yeah. Um, so as it relates to reform, uh, this became a big issue, obviously, after the Breonna Taylor tragedy in our city. Um, I'd always used audits to determine whether or not our departments are operating the way that they should. I, Audits to me expose gaps, and you can get to work for the gap on the gaps, and then that creates more citizen satisfaction. So I like audits, and I think good organizations should like audits because they're a pathway to more rapid improvement. In 2016, we were recognized as one of the highest performing police departments in the country by the Obama administration. We got another nod to our good work in 2019, and then 2020 happens. Uh, I can tell you, if you drop into any major police department in the country and do the kind of audits we've done with Hillard Heinz, which I ordered after Breonna Taylor's shooting or what the Department of Justice does, you're going to find all kinds of stuff. So the question is, you know, how do you get deep enough in your audits to uncover, let's say, in the Breonna Taylor tragedy, the kind of thing that appears to have led to that, which was a dishonest police officer falsely getting a search warrant? How do you stop that process? you know, with multiple sign-offs required for multiple people. So there's all these different safeguards in place. So these audits and accreditations are not deep enough, uh, in my opinion. Uh, now, to answer your question a little bit more fully, that the number one asset 
a police department has. You know what it is? The community. Okay, so how do you have legitimacy between your police and your community so that they're working together to co-produce public safety? And how do you have people in the police department that look at the community that way and vice versa? So this is a journey that America is on and we're on as well because policing is at an inflection point in our country. Uh, you see that through the various crises that ripple around the various cities that we're in right now with officer-involved shootings, uh, citizens shooting police officers, you know, all of this stuff. And then the baggage of uh, racial inequity that still is in our country. It's something that's still to be figured out. The Department of Justice, you know, should be releasing their investigation letters sometime in the first quarter of this next year, and then the city will negotiate with them in terms of what next steps will be. The good news is that from day one, we've never waited on any agency, outside agency, to tell us what to do. Uh, when we did the top to bottom review of the police department with the Hillard Heinz investigation, that came up with 120 different recommendations that were already hard at, hard at work on through a newly formed accountability and improvement bureau. Uh, so all this is a great pave way for whatever the Department of Justice is going to come up with. And we created a civilian review and accountability board. So there's more civilian oversight of the police department. And that board consists of people that were protest leaders and people that represent the police department as well. These groups have to come together to identify what common interests are to move a city forward. In the Filson's um, portrait collection, Upstairs, we have a portrait of Isaac Shelby and another portrait of um, William Clark of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And they face um, a plywood piece of art that we acquired after the Breonna Taylor protests of um, a woman um, who is uh, protesting angry about the country, angry about what's happened. And it's really a fascinating juxtaposition to see uh, them across the room from each other, gazing at these portraits, gazing at each other. And it's, it, it comes to my mind when you say, yeah, we've got opposing viewpoints and opposing groups looking at um, the whole issue of public safety and policing. And, and it, it, it makes sense to me when you say, hey, we're perhaps at a uh, inflection point of it right now. Well, we are. And when you think about the different points of view, I mean, we've had everything from defund the police to defund the FBI. Okay, yeah. think about that, how crazy that is in terms of points of view. And during the protests, I would literally have back-to-back -back meetings where a group would come in and say, the protesters are totally out of control. Our city will never recover from this, and you need to crack down on those people. The next meeting would be people coming in and saying, your police department is totally out of control, and you have to defund the police department now. Yeah. And you know that kind of is a snapshot of, of what that time was like. And so how do you navigate through that as a city. And, uh, you know, my view was uh, we got two goals, the truth and the accountability for anybody that broke the law. And, uh, you know, people wanted quick decisions. They felt like I should be a judge, the jury and the executioner. One, I don't have that power just as the mayor, but two, you don't know what the facts are and you have to let due process play itself out. And most people aren't patient for that and i understand why especially in our black population who for centuries you know have been on the wrong end of the bargain of this being america uh now as time unfolded and the department of justice came out with their investigation i think our approach turned out to be the right approach but uh, it was very difficult in that summer of 2020 in the fall of 2020 with the pandemic and i was having to defend america's cities against donald trump who was you know sending federal troops into different American cities. And it, that was a, a challenging time. Um, let's shift to uh, maybe a, a more um, happy topic, and that is capital. 
um, infrastructure investments yeah. and your achievements there and any disappointments that you might have? Well, that's been phenomenal, I believe, because we started our uh, administration now in retrospect, which was the emergence coming out of the Great Recession. And we didn't know that at the time. But the first uh, four years, 2011 to 2014, the budgets were very slim. So of our 12 budgets, we had to cut 11 times of the 12 budgets just because of the pension uh, cost. Uh, but despite all that, we were able to get uh, $24 billion of capital improvements in our city, which is by far the most ever. I uh, wanted to focus, too, on the West End, so about $1.5 billion in the West End. The good news for that, it's the most ever in history. The bad news is it's the most ever in history. You know, since the flood in 1937, the West End has been deinvested in. But when you take a look at the skyline of our city, uh, it's totally changed. Uh, I wanted to see if we could get the Ohio River Bridges project done uh, because we all know how long, I mean, for 40 years when I became uh, mayor, it was still being talked about. And then Steve Bashir asked if I would go with him to meet with Mitch Daniels because they wanted to get the latest on how people were feeling about the bridges and uh, big projects, four and a half billion dollar budget. So we met in Mitch Daniels office and I said, what are you hearing? I said, people are for it uh, if it can be a dollar toll for regular users. And they're like, well, that's not possible because this costs four and a half billion dollars. And I'm the dumb business guy and the heads of the Department of Transportation are sitting there. And I said, well, is this, have the, has the project been value engineered yet? Two governors look at each other. They look at the DOT heads and they're like, no. Uh, and it's like, it's a beautiful over-designed project. So they went back and redesigned it, came back at two and a half billion dollars, which led it lead to the dollar toll. Yeah. So um, I felt good about that. Uh, but we've just, you know, new hotels, bourbonism, over a hundred new hotels, 15 downtown, the whole thing of bourbonism has been created. Yeah. If, explain bourbonism, if you will. Well, so I'm a business guy again, and you know, to have a good business, you need a great value proposition. You know, so I see Frank Carshaw over here, Great value proposition to train. Nobody can provide the same level of service, the same quality of product. So they're going to do business with Frank. Okay, so what's the city's value proposition? Why would somebody uniquely come here? What do we have that nobody else has? Well, we got a bunch of things. But one of the things I didn't understand was, why aren't we promoting bourbon more? Um, and I'm not a big drinker at all. And people say, oh, we can't do that because that'll sully our reputation. People will come here and get wasted. You know, I said, well, no, we want to let's do a high end, celebrate our local food culture uh, that we've got restaurants as good as anywhere in the world, integrate that with our bourbon industry. And so I called some meetings early on in that there was all this turf fighting and territorial stuff. I own bourbon. No, I own bourbon. You know, it's like I, like we own bourbon. The whole people here do. You know, so why don't we come together? and create a Napa Valley kind of experience uh, for tourism and attracting conventions and leading to great venues. So we had, well, the first couple of meetings were a little rocky, but the people that weren't on board eventually found their way off of the project. And uh, that's how bourbonism was started. And we're just getting started. I mean, the, the quality of our products and experiences is incredible. And tourism is going through the roof. You know, tourism is way beyond what it was before the pandemic started, just like our economic recovery is as well. So bourbonism has ended up being this five-star experience that draws people from all over the region. Now we're starting to market to the country and to the world. Only 3% of the visitors that come for bourbonism are from outside America. We haven't marketed there yet. So on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being maximum penetration, I think we're probably at about a three or so. So which makes a city fun. You know, you got to have a hospitality concept. So that's what was behind it. And it's been one of the fun things to do. You know, it's like, cause you're dealing with the pretty heavy stuff and it doesn't get to my desk unless it's kind of heavy, you know, but well, when, that, like, that's why I shifted from yeah, police so reform that's, to bourbonism. When bourbonism comes in, it's like, that's great. Let's have a meeting about yeah. bourbonism. Like, cause then you got good food, might have some good bourbon. It's all good. I'm the only mayor, I think in the country that if you're having a toast of bourbon before noon, your citizens expect that. <laughs> um, education, 
and also public libraries. Talk to us about what you're doing there, what, what you've done. And, and yeah, well, when you, significant right, so when you talk about lifelong learning, those two things are, you know, just right in the sweet spot. Now, not many mayors around the country control the, the school systems and the school board. And so the mayor in Louisville does not either, as you know, they're independently elected. So you've got to make a choice. Some mayors have said, I'm just going to be totally hands off with the school system because they got to run their own thing. My approach was, we have 100,000 of our residents in the school system. How can we not in, get involved with them in some kind of way and form the future leaders of our city as well? So we got about 100,000 public and about 30,000 in private uh, schools. And then how does that work with our workforce needs? So Marty Polio has been an incredible uh, public school superintendent. And Donna Hargens before him did a, a good job as well in terms of partners with our Cradle to Career and our Evolve 502 initiative. So we had a distinct focus on that with 55,000 degrees. That was just college. Then we broadened it to uh, pre-K all the way through careers. And that's where JCPS and the JCTA was involved with that and focused on how do we develop our kids from early care and pre-K and then K to 12 post-secondary and careers. So that's where the college scholarship programs came from. That's where the out-of-school time assistance came from. That's where the academies of Louisville came from. So JCPS now partners with about 140 companies that are in our primary economic development verticals, which are advanced manufacturing, food and beverage, uh, logistics, uh, aging and wellness innovation, and business services. So the kids in those high schools are selecting what they want to focus in and then those businesses bring real life experience to them and then get engaged with them through our summer works program. So our summer works program, uh, we created the first year in office as the federal government was pulling out of funding that kind of work. We had to quickly make a decision whether or not we were going to just say, okay, or double down on that. And so I still remember the first paycheck I ever got. And I assume you all do as well. And it felt good to have your own money in your own pocket as a young kid and learn how to work. So I made a call to uh, David Jones, who was alive at that time, and said, you know, David needs some help on this, if he would give a lead gift on that. And he said, I'll put in $250,000. And so we raised about a million dollars that first year and started our Summer Works program, which has helped over 40,000 kids now. So when you think about this continuum of you can go to high school for a career interest that feeds into the workforce needs of our companies. Our companies are involved with that. You can get a summer job associated with that to see if you're interested. And then you can get a free college scholarship through Evolve 502. It's been some of my most rewarding work in terms of when you think about trying to change the cycle of poverty and get kids excited about work and prepare our workforce. Um. Turning to poverty, the issues of homelessness and affordable housing. Where are we? Are you satisfied with the progress? Are there things that you wish you could have realized more? Yeah. So, you know, people, uh, I think everybody knows, you know, why is there the level of homelessness that we have in this country uh, versus, let's say, 30 years ago? Uh, Louisville is relatively in good shape. You know, we've got about 300 people that are chronically homeless. Uh, Los Angeles, obviously much bigger city has 50,000. Uh, you know, Seattle has 15,000. Nashville would be around 1,400. Uh, it's dispiriting though. When you, like I was in India uh, 10 days ago and you see people living by the railroad tracks and this type of thing. And I've been to India four times, you know, and back in the day, it's like, look how these folks are living. Well, you go anywhere in America right now, you see people living by interstate overpasses and, you know, that's a, that's a whole nother challenge. Fortunately, uh, you know, we, I mean, the origin of this problem was in 1980s when, and this sounds bad, but, you know, when people were deinstitutionalized, most of the folks that are homeless have either a mental health or some type of substance abuse problem. And of that, a lot of them have both. And so we don't have here in Louisville much of what you see like in these West Coast cities where they're just economic homelessness because it's so expensive to live there. 
So when these folks were deinstitutionalized, if they weren't accepted back into their families, where'd they go? You know, they went out on the streets. You know, so America used to pay for this, but they don't anymore. So one of the manifestations of that is the affordable housing crisis that's in America and is in Louisville as well. So for instance, we have a need for about 27,000 more affordable housing units. It's what's called 30% adjusted median income, which is for people that make less than $20,000 a year. So that's about a $5 billion problem. And so if it's $5 billion here, in Cincinnati, it's $8 billion. In Nashville, it's $8 billion. So you put all the, every city has its own version of this. So America basically has chosen not to fund housing for folks that are in bad shape, either from an economic standpoint or a mental health standpoint. So we were able to make some progress against this with the American Rescue Plan money, put about $100 million into homeless mitigation and affordable housing about $110 million in total. Uh, in the previous uh, mayor's administration, they put $7 million in. So it's been a massive increase, but it's just a drop in the bucket for what's needed. And, and I, I predict at some point in time, the federal government is going to have to have some huge housing initiative because at the city government level, you just don't have the kind of money you need to deal with this. Our total budget's about a billion dollars a year. We are taxed in Louisville amongst our peer cities at the bottom quartile. In other words, we don't tax ourselves very much for the type of services that we need. Our library system should have more funding. Our park system should be more funding when you compare ourselves to other peer cities, not to mention this huge issue like affordable housing. So I'm very proud of the progress that we've made. I'm very appreciative of Bill Hollander as a council person who's been the lead on that, uh, but it's nowhere near what it should be. Uh, in terms of our uh, uh, homelessness situation, it's significantly better than what it was, but it's still very dispiriting. And of course, one of the things that bothers people is panhandlers. Panhandlers uh, constitutionally have the right to do what they do. It makes people uncomfortable, uh, but you can't arrest them for doing that. You can't move them along. When you do that, what happens ultimately, the Department of Justice comes in and says you're breaking the Constitution. So this is kind of the American mix that we're living in. We just happen to have our own version of it here in the city. So I'm proud of the progress, uh, but there's a lot left to do. Your administration has been, in my perception, free or relatively free of scandal and public corruption. How have you managed over the 12 years to promote that sense? Well, this is going to sound super wonky, uh, but I think, you know, to run a great organization, you've got to have clear values, which we do. Two, you've got to have a great planning process, and then you've got to have a very effective way in monitoring and diagnosing your plan and your finances. So that's the result of, you know, specific architecture around a strategic planning process and then how our teams are developed and then how they report their work, both from a reactive standpoint on the problems that we have every day, but the proactive stuff on the plan. So I challenge every department to be the best in the world at what they do. And when you go through each one of our departments, it is amazing to see the progress they've made over these last 12 years because of their focus on improvement and innovation. And then every month, they're reporting on that through what we call Louis Stat. We created this system that's a stat-based, key performance uh, metric base. So all this is based on like total quality principles that I worked with a lot in the private sector. So when you do that, there's it's hard to hide any malfeasance because of both the budgetary overview and the performance overview. Uh, and I think people are genuinely good. Uh, but there's when we've got an organization of about 6,000 people, so there's going to be a few outliers. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree with you. We've had, we've had some issues that come up as a result of police, mis, you know, uh, bad choices, misconduct, anytime, anything that's come up, what we've done right away is put the spotlight on it. We'll bring special investigators in, but from a financial standpoint, I'm not really aware of anything like you have. So I'm very grateful for that because I I inherited, I think, a pretty good government too. 
uh, when you think about local governments, you can think of on one side, uh, let's say total corruption and ineptitude, and then on the other side would be you know purity and high performance. And on a scale of one to ten, I think you know Louisville Metro government when we started was in the you know let's say seven-ish range, and maybe now we're in the eight-ish range, which is really good. And I hope our people appreciate that because when you go to some cities, it's a problem. You know, and you know you can't pick up garbage. The streets aren't cleared when it's uh, snowing. Uh, money's being stolen. So we've, you know, in my humble opinion, we've had a, a pretty good run of good mayors in the city over our uh, over our history. And we just got to figure out a way. The the key, the key to, you know, when you see cities that are really popping, there's a lot more population growth that's taking place. And you know, so why does population growth happen? One, I think it's, you know, a geographical advantage. So you're either by a body of water or you're in the mountains uh, or you have a major uh, large uh, research institution. So think like Austin, Texas and the flows they've had out of that from a technology standpoint. So U of L needs to get much bigger uh, and, uh, and much more innovative. Uh, so those are the two kind of things that make a city grow rapidly. Uh, and other than that, or if you have, let's say, if we had five humanists, something like that take place. So you got to keep focusing on entrepreneurship. See Kent Willard here. He's done an awful lot of good in that area. But so you work with what you got and you try to grow because you got to grow to create opportunity. And not every city like us grows either. Is that why you've gone to India four times? <laughs> well, two of them were his mayor. Uh, <laughs> those were those were to visit the, with the Dalai Lama. You know, that has been a real beautiful thing about this. You know, when uh, he came in 2013 to bless our local Buddhist monastery, and I asked, uh, you know, could we put on a compassion festival? And you all might remember that it was a three day festival that was incredible. You know, he's the Buddha of compassion. So he was fascinated that a city would have compassion as a value. So I've been able to develop a relationship with him over the years uh, that has been really special. And I've taken mayors to visit him a couple of times because my my hope, and I hopefully you can see this, is I think the main thing you should do to run a great business or a great city is be clear on your values, number one. And with compassion, one of our values, uh, if we can start as elected leaders and as secular leaders like you all are by saying, look, before we talk about anything else, let's make sure we're getting the kindness and compassion and love thing good. You know, and if we're helping each other that way, then guess what? Everything else is going to work out fine. But the reality is, is that that's too tough for most people to take on. We have some audience questions. Sure. Joining us virtually. Um, this is similar to one of the questions that was in our virtual audience. Uh, it seems that the so-called Ninth Street divide continues to divide us as a community. How do you assess our progress in breaking down the divide and what more can be done moving forward? Yeah, and maybe I'm an optimist on that. I think there's been huge progress made on the Ninth Street divide, which is in people's minds. Uh, there's a lot more movement in the community east and west and west to east than what there was before. Uh, it was a very clear strategy that we had to invest a billion and a half dollars. And then our strategy was to center it around the Russell neighborhood. It's about 9,000 people in the Russell neighborhood. There's nine different neighborhoods in West Louisville, 60,000 people. If it was its own city, it'd be the third largest city in the uh, Commonwealth. So it's hard to generalize about what the West End of Louisville is. But that, in, that strategy was to have anchor investments on each side of Russell. So it was Beecher Terrace redevelopment on the east side, which is $250 million. On the west side, it's the track and uh, field facility. That was city property we gave to the Urban League. We put the first $10 million in uh, for that to make that happen. On the north side, it's Waterfront Park Phase 4. And then on the south side, it's all the redevelopment happening along uh, Broadway. And then the West End Opportunity Partnership, uh, and then the racial justice issues in 2020 kind of woke up a lot of white America and white Louisville to invest more in equity issues. So when you think about how long racism has been around or institutional racism, I mean, you know, it's the history of our country. 
So right. it's going to take a while to unpack that. The last thing is on uh, Ninth Street is a physical uh, barrier. Uh, if you don't know, there was a guy named Harlan Bartholomew who was called the father of city planning based out of St. Louis. And one of his principles was it was important to build uh, physical barriers between the predominantly large white business district and the encroaching black neighborhoods. So when you go to cities and you see railroad tracks or an interstate or a Martin Luther King Boulevard, or in our case, Ninth Street and that broad boulevard that separates downtown, these were physical structures that were put in place to keep people apart from each other. So we just received, after six years of trying at what's called a federal raise grant uh, that's going to allow us now to take that physical Ninth Street broad boulevard and turn it into a narrower thoroughfare and activate each side of the street with retail and restaurants and walkability. Uh, so you're eliminating the physical divide. So to me, that's kind of a nice capstone. It will be built in uh, 24. That's going to be a beautiful day for the city. So Mayor, we're getting a lot of comments. Just thank you. Okay. And so I can echo that myself, but uh, thank you for your continued support of lifelong learning and of the libraries and bike lanes. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but we have some other questions for you as bike well. Bike lanes were interesting, Julie, because people want to politicize bike lanes. I mean, bike lanes around the country are like everywhere because people want alternate modes of transportation, but that became a very political issue here, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So if you had one big decision to redo, what would it be and why? Well, probably I've referred to it before, and this is probably unrealistic, but I wonder, you know, is there a way to have deep accreditation of each of your departments so you are really getting down to the nitty gritty? When you think about the momentum our city has now, but had going into the summer of 2020 or 2020, and then the pandemic hit, which of course disrupted the entire world. Uh, and then on top of that, the protests hit. You know, so is there a way to get so deep into departments that you just make sure nothing wrong or bad ever happens? And my experience in life is that's impossible. Uh, so the question is, how do you respond to things when they do happen? And then how do you get to work around them very quickly? So I can't point to any one thing Julie at one time that said, ah, if we made that decision, that would have impacted this in a different way. Because we've had a very decentralized approach to both you know, planning and then reacting to problems uh, as, as an organization. So I don't know if the Monday morning quarterbacking does very much good for us. Anytime, it's been, especially it was interesting after 2020, I can't tell you how many people come up and say, you know, I don't agree with everything you did, but I don't know what I would have done any differently. And it's like, well, welcome to the arena. What are your plans for the future? I'm going to take a pause. Uh, you know, uh, I could use a nap, uh, number one. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this has been a super uh, busy time. I like being busy. Uh, you know, I, I retired for a time before I was mayor, so to speak. And I was very unhappy. Uh, doing that because I mean I think we're all born to make a difference I was still active in kind of public things but I like building organizations that can help people so uh, I'm, I'm just saying no to everything uh, right now and I've got a lot of travel uh, planned and I've got a few small commitments here and there but I'd like to find a way back into helping in some kind of way so I'm going to take it back to Dick for our, our final question that's what we're um, doing already, huh? You just lost your father. He was a remarkable man. Um, have you had the time to take his measure and to grieve? And is that part of your short-term and your long-term thinking? That's a tough question to close on, man. Uh he he was worth that question. Yeah. Well, the good thing is, uh, you know, he was my best friend and there was no unfinished business uh, and our lives were that way. And, you know, so when you think about uh, 
you know, some people carry so much bitterness and uh, with them and, you know, life's too short for that. So he had a great life, 90 years. Uh, we celebrated his birthday on Friday. And then on Tuesday morning, he looked at my mom and just, you know, and they were married 67 years. And so if you think about any way that you'd like to go, man, he hit a home run on that. And then he was uh, 78 years old when he and my mom started the family community clinic uh, in Butchertown to serve people free with health care. Uh, who does that at 78 or 79 years old? You know, it's kind of like the final challenge to from my dad. Like to all of you all, I'll ask you all, what's your startup going to be when you're in your late 70s to help people? So, uh, and, and in the last year in particular, we talked a lot about, uh, you know, not his death, but the fact that he wasn't going to be around forever. So that's how you logically process it. But it's hard, you know, he said, it's hard not to be able to call him. I want to thank you um, for the last 12 years. Mm -hmm. And I also want to thank you for being here with us tonight, uh, those in the audience and those watching. Uh, and this is, is something that will be on the Filson's uh, website and YouTube over the years. So you've helped us tonight fulfill our mission, which is to uh, collect, preserve, and share the stories of Kentucky and Ohio Valley history. Um, you really have seen significant growth and vibrancy in this city and some sadness and troubled times here at the end. But somehow or another, it seems to me, and, and as a person who suffered from COVID, uh, that the last two years have, we, we've seen a revival. So my parting question is, is downtown now returning to the vibrancy that it was enjoying uh, before the pandemic? Uh, and that, I guess, includes office vacancy rates. Are they going up? Do you, do you see a city downtown that's turned the corner? Yeah. So the answer to that is yes and no. Um, six weeks ago, we had a, a city lab that's put on by uh, Bloomberg and Aspen Institute, and it was in Amsterdam. So mayors from all over the world, there were 30 of us. And the first half of the first day was, what is the future of downtowns? Okay, so this is for mayors from all over the world. People tend to always think, oh, this is just a Louisville problem. Uh, these are global problems that we often suffer with, and that's important for context. So from a tourism standpoint, it's off the charts downtown yeah. in terms of what it was before 2019. Nightlife, the same thing. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in terms of uh, return to work. Uh, so... On a, on a busy day downtown, probably now about 60% of the pre-pandemic level folks are downtown. On a slow day, it's probably more in the 20 to 25% range. And that matters because it impacts our restaurant and our retail that we need there to support the convention and tourist business. The good news is tourism ups. So that's created some new vibrancy as well. But what is the future of work when you think about people going to offices? Uh, some companies have stayed and downsized. Other companies have grown their footprint because their people want more room to operate. But downtown office vacancy is lower than what it was before. And so it's not clear to me what's going to happen here in other cities that are not walkable downtown cities like the European cities uh, in terms of the future. So it's going to take a while to kind of sort that out. So in the meantime, you do what you can to activate downtown. As I mentioned, I think tourism is going to take care of itself because of urbanism, and it's doing that. Uh, it's hard to convert office buildings to residential. Uh, people say, well, just do that. Well, you know, to, to take an office building and make it uh, safe and suitable for housing and the kind of water systems you need for that, I mean, that's a big project. 
So it's, I would say, I know it's not a very satisfied, satisfactory, satisfactory answer, but it's in process right now of figuring out where we're going as a city and where the country is going for that. So I'm happy on one hand, on the other hand, I'm not happy, but it's going to, it's going to rest on what businesses decide to do with their employees. And in an era of super low unemployment, when the employees have the uh, upper end on the bargaining of the side of the relationship between the employer and the employee, where if you say, hey, you got to come back to work, and they say, well, you know what, I like working from home, and I got three other offers where I can do that, so I'm not coming back to work. So I think ultimately what it's going to be probably is people are going to be back in the office for three or four days, you know, those that can virtually work. And there'll be some type of new reality that we adapt to. I'm always very confident in our ability to adapt to situations, sometimes not immediately, but over time, we're a very entrepreneurial, uh, creative group. And on that, maybe Dick, if I could just close uh, by saying the thing that's most important to all of this is to uh, adhere to what uh, Supreme Court Justice and Louisvillian, Louis Brandeis said, when he said, pay attention to the quality of the most important political office in the country. And you know what that is? The office of citizen. Okay, so we as Americans often are pointing the fingers at who should be doing what for us. And Louis Brandeis reminded us in the early 1900s that if we don't have active engaged citizenship, if we don't have people doing something for others and expecting nothing in return, except they get to be citizens of Louisville or Kentucky or America, we're in trouble. So let's, I'm not worried about you all being here on a Thursday night, you're exercising citizenship right now, but let's inspire our kids and grandkids and friends and neighbors to engage in this wonderful, wonderful, uh, democracy experiment that we've got going on in our city that we've got going on. And there's nothing that feels better than when you help somebody. And so you get so much more out of it yourself and you could be busy and you could be this, but everybody can take the time to stop and help somebody, uh, whether it's an individual act or a big act like many of you all do. So let's keep citizenship alive. Let's really lean into that with our compassion initiatives and our city can continue the wonderful momentum that we have. And we can show like we did that we can get through tough times. That's really when you're measured, not when everything is great. It's like when you get knocked down, like we did in 2020 and the whole country did, how do you come back from that? And how do you stay positive? And how do you respect people throughout all that and exercise great citizenship? So Phil, I know Dick, that's a big mission of yours. Here's at Philson and it's just it indispensable. So thank you for this opportunity tonight. Thank you for being with us, Mayor. Okay. Thank you all.